Welcome to today's episode of the Founders Lounge, where I talk to some of the best founders in the UK to share their stories, learn their lessons, and hopefully inspire some more people to start their own business. In today's episode, my guest was Paul Blair. He is a founder of a few different businesses. The most recent one is called ArcX, and it's a smart ring that you can use to control your, your mobile phone or other devices. But his career actually started in the military, so he spent 20 years in the military, which I always find very interesting because I think it's quite challenging. And I think you learn a lot of interesting lessons by having that sort of career. So we talk a lot about difficult moments and leadership and performance and all the sort of lessons that he learned in the military and that he's now applying in his uh, life as a founder. And then we talk about his different businesses and how he builds them. And we talk about, which is quite funny, uh, he was on Dragon's Den and he kind of talks about behind the scenes, what happened there and how he had kind of a funny, silly experience. Um, and yeah, his final business is called ArcX, which is a hardware business. And that's always interesting. It's a little bit more difficult than software. It tends to be a bit more challenging and time consuming. So I think that's a very interesting experience as well. So I hope you're going to enjoy the episode. And if you like this kind of stories, make sure to subscribe. So you're going to get notified about new episodes every week. Now enjoy the episode. All right, Paul, welcome to the Founders Lounge. Atis, hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely a pleasure. Um, so let's start with you've had quite a lengthy career in the army and can you give a you know quick overview of what was that and what was that like sure um so after a business degree uh, in my last two or three years um of that degree i was i was thinking what i wanted to do and i know my my parents wanted me wanted me to move into the city and uh, and get a job there but uh, after that degree i decided not to do that and, and join the army so a year at the royal military academy sandhurst uh, I then uh, went into joined the regular army, joined the parachute regiment, and I didn't have any fixed idea of how long I was going to spend in the army. Didn't have any longer term views about my career, but uh, it had to be a minimum of three years. But three years turned into twenty, and uh, towards the end of that time, I realised that yeah, I ticked all of those boxes that an army career. Uh, offered and it was time to start thinking about a second career and, and moving into the world of business and I had a sort of uh, I had some entrepreneurial sort of thoughts and ideas so uh, that seemed like a uh, a good time to go in 2012 I left okay and so there are a few questions so I think I had one guest a few episodes ago Ben Williams the founder of Lupin I don't know if you know him so I do. He, yes, you do. You do. Okay. So <laughs> he also had an like a, quite an extensive career in the army, and I have a huge respect for anyone who's done that. I think it's a very brave thing to do. I think it's a very um, I see it as a very difficult thing to do. Um, so one thing that I'd love to talk to you about maybe a little bit later is what's the kind of difference that you see, or what's I suppose life in the military versus life as a founder or you know what's what's the difference there or the, the similarities there as well but maybe before we get to that um what were some interesting stories from your time in the army that are either interesting or that bring some lessons well um yeah so many over over 20 years so many great memories of fun times. Um, like anyone who's spent any amount of time in the armed forces will agree that um, that bond, that camaraderie, you know, you make friends for life just through that shared experiences of quite often hardships, uh, going through all sorts of training exercises and just in a certain scenario thinking that this is, things couldn't get any worse, normally that involves uh, wet and cold uh, situations in this country, um, obviously lack of sleep, 
and um, running on on empty. Um, you know, so many experiences over the years um, on multiple uh, operational tours. I did seven in the end. But towards the end of my career, I joined the Red Devils, which is the British Army's uh, parachute team, um, which was for me just a huge blast and the best way. Uh, to transition out of the army. I spent most of my time um, in sports kit, learning to fall out of perfectly serviceable aircraft all over the world. But clearly we had it, there was a serious side to it. We were representing uh, the British Army. We had a PR and recruitment job to do. But um, you know, one story in particular that still uh, to this day uh, almost gives me goosebumps. We were um, jumping in America. We'd been invited to the uh, Jacksonville National Air Show. Uh, we exited the aircraft at about 10,000 feet in a tight formation and uh, one of the guys opposite me in this free fall formation, now bear in mind we're falling at 120 miles an hour, you know, we've got limited time to think before we break off and go into uh, various uh, aspects of our display and start deploying our canopies. But I noticed on my opposite number that the Velcro top flap on a little bag he was wearing around his waist um, was failing and it was starting to flap and inside that bag is some heavy metal carabiners and a strap that they use when they're they're under canopy and there was nothing I could do about it but I just remember everything going into slow motion this velcro strap um, failed and this heavy carabiner collection of metal work descended um, a lot faster than, than we were and just below us lined up in a perfect line was uh, seven or eight of the US Navy's uh, Blue Angels aircraft display team and each one of them those aircraft is worth about I don't know 65 million dollars and this piece of heavy metal was rattling uh, southwards towards them. Nothing we could do <laughs> and so we broke off, deployed our parachutes Clearly the, the show had to go on, so we performed the, the rest of our display and acted as if nothing uh, would happen. There was obviously a serious aspect to that, that um, you know, if anyone had been close to where that metal work had landed, they could have been injured, but um, it had fallen between the wingtips and there was probably about maybe three or four meters distance between the, the wingtips of these two aircraft and it uh, carved out a large chunk of concrete uh, in the ground. Um, if that had have hit an aircraft, uh, that would have been me having a very serious interview without coffee. Uh, careers would have ended. There would have been all sorts of problems. But yeah, um, that didn't happen. So we had a, a, long, a lot of debriefing points. And um, like a lot of things, whether it's in the military, um, in business, you learn from your mistakes and you learn never to make the same mistakes again and you move on. Mm. All right, before we continue, I want to take a second to talk about our sponsor. I've always been saying that one of the best ways to learn about business is by working closely with a smart and successful entrepreneur, and this might be your opportunity. Our sponsor is a company called JudgeMe. JudgeMe is a Shopify product review plugin, and they're the number one plugin on Shopify. They're literally, if you look at the Shopify app store, they're in the first spot. They're bootstrapped, and they managed to outcompete other companies that raised hundreds of millions of dollars by just being smarter and building a better product. They were started by PJ, who was also a guest on the Founders Lounge, episode 54, so I recommend you to check it out. They recently moved their headquarters to London and they're looking for smart people to join them. They're looking for product managers, engineers, and they're looking to fill other roles as well. So check out careers.judge.me and see if you find any role that you like and apply. So that's careers.judge.me. Now, enjoy the rest of the episode. Well, so obviously, I mean, stakes can be high. Sometimes life is on the line as well, right? Uh, often if you're in that kind of territory. So how do you think when you, so when you were finishing your army career, was it, was it obvious to you that you're going to start a business that you're, you're going, you're going to become a founder or did you have other, you know, other considerations? I, I had some firm ideas um, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, to start a company, to, to create something. And it was in my final two years that I had an idea for a dog toy. Like all the businesses I founded, it was based on personal experience and I thought I could, uh, I could do something better. I thought I could satisfy a gap in the market. So I started doing that almost in tandem with uh, my um, army career, so it was about the last 18 months or so, so actually had, by the time I left, 
uh, the business uh-huh. was almost up and running. Uh-huh. Would you say, is that is that a common thing that people after the army, they go and start a business? Because it's, it's kind of, I can, obviously I've never been in those shoes, right? So it's, it's hard for me to say how it is, but I can see it going different ways, right? You could say, well, this was like a really difficult period of my life. Now I want to do something that's maybe a little bit easier. Or you could say, well, you know, I, I became really mentally strong and this was a good kind of um, learning experience. And now I'm going to go into business and I don't know, risk taking and high performance kind of work. Um, I don't know. There are different ways how I could see that evolving after after a military career. Yeah, it all comes down to the individual. So many friends left and went into the corporate world. Um, quite a few went into consulting. I know a lot of um, soldiers go into the um, private security world. A lot of friends and peers of mine moved into uh, into that uh, into the security sector. But yeah, there are quite a few entrepreneurs, and I think the those transferable skills that the soft skills that uh, we get from a military military career, they do lend themselves to the entrepreneurial world. So um, not so many people in terms of their appetite for risk. Um, you know, there's that, um, I think, adversity to risk because we mm. spend so often, um, so much of our time dealing with limited resources um, in a quickly changing and um, adverse adverse environment that um, you know, we're accustomed to taking risks and mm-hmm. looking, coming up with a plan, being re- resourceful, uh, being resilient and, and making things happen. And so I think those um, soft skills, yeah, do lend themselves to um, the entrepreneurial world. Mm, that, I, was, I would imagine leadership skills as well, probably. For sure, yeah. And throughout our training at, at every rank, we, obviously train for the next rank up, but also we'll be looking one or two or three ranks up mm-hmm. um, because should the situation, uh, if it's an operational combat situation, if things go wrong and um, someone in a leader, leadership position uh, gets injured, then someone will very quickly step into to their shoes. And so we've got to be prepared for that. So yeah, leadership at every level. Mm, interesting. I remember when I was talking to Ben and one thing that I asked him, I was like, um, I was wondering what kind of perspective that gives you in life, right? Because I said, well, if you are in a role, so if you're in the military and you're, um, you know, you're on a battlefield sometimes, right? And there's, there's life at stake. And it's, I, I feel like that's, you know, that's, that's like the ultimate thing. That's a, that's a very difficult thing. Right. Um, I feel like I keep talking about that, but I, I don't know. I really have respect for it. I really, I feel like it gives you a completely different perspective in comparison to, you know, in my job or in my work, I mean, the most difficult thing that can happen is, well, I don't know, I'm going to have a stressful day. Um, maybe somebody's going to lose a job, not a life, right? Maybe somebody's going to be upset, but nobody's going to get physically hurt, injured. Um, I wonder how you see that, how you think about it. Is, is, is there a certain perspective that that gives you on life and on your career later after the military? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, I've said to the teams, the various teams I've worked with um, over the years that when things get stressful, and they do, um, let's face it, if you're pitching for the survival of your business or negotiating a key sales contract um, and potentially livelihoods are on the line, there is a lot of pressure um, in that situation. But certainly with my previous experience in multiple uh, contact situations, multiple firefights, yeah, it does It does change the perspective slightly. So I've always said to teams, whenever the, the pressure is on, listen, you know, no one's going to get killed. No one's going to get pregnant as a result of what we're doing. So let's just, you know, everyone take a deep breath. You know, we've prepared as well as we can prepare. So, you know, let's, let's get on it. Let's enjoy it. And if, mm. if we fail, well, hey, you know, like, like that parachuting incident, let's learn by our mistakes and, and try again next time. Mm. Yeah. So one thing that I remember that Ben said also is he said that in the military, you have, um, 
short periods of very high stress and long periods of low stress. While as a founder, that was his experience at least, while as a founder, you tend to have constant relatively high stress. So there, you don't have those kind of extremely high spikes necessarily, but it's just a constant day after day, um, a relatively stressful situation. Yeah. Um, and that stress can come and come and go. It can affect people in different ways. You know, now more than ever, the whole discussion and debate about mental health is is getting more sunlight, uh, and, and rightly so. And we all have our own challenges um, all day, every day. But um, as founders, you're right, it, it can be a different type of stress. And, and every day, um, or even multiple times in the same day, there's another mm -hmm. challenge, there's another obstacle to overcome. Things aren't going well. Um, so, yeah, I've spent... You know, the last 10 years as, as a founder uh, and also I spent four or five years in the corporate world as well just thinking more about how I manage my own stress but also you know looking at the team and you know I think any founder or any anyone in a leadership position it all comes down to people and it is getting to know people as as well as you possibly can and so when someone has a an off day and we all do recognizing that and maybe as a leader you know taking your foot off the gas a little bit not pushing them for whatever the business requirement is but not pushing them as, as hard as you would do normally and just recognizing that they need a little bit of um you have know, to come down that curve uh they need a little bit of sort of quiet time just to manage that stress and if there's something to talk about then clearly you know that there's a conversation that needs to be had but yeah i think you know individuals we all re react to different types of stresses in different ways some people just coast through life um i've got a couple of annoying friends that never seem to get phased about anything and it's just yeah well you know and they just ride that that storm whatever yeah. it is whereas um <laughs> most of us who uh, are a little bit i don't know emotionally tuned to uh, the world we're in yeah we obviously do have those highs and lows and it's um certainly as as founders because there will always come those obstacles and those challenges but it's i found that you know, all those little milestones, those little successes, um, those little achievements is recognizing those, celebrating them, not talking about, you know, popping champagne, but just acknowledging everyone's work and um, that that combined team effort and you and celebrate those successes so that when you do hit the obstacles and the problems come, um, you know, you, you've got that sort of shared bonded experience that you can recognize, okay, well, this is a problem. Let's put it aside. Let's focus mm. on, on how we overcome this and hit our next milestone. Mm. What about performance? So I, I think about performance quite a lot. And again, I, I think I see a lot of similarities here with the military because you, you I mean, you, you have to perform, right? I think you, you're, you're trained to perform at a very high level and a lot of entrepreneurs, they also, I mean, you have to perform in a different way and you need to also mentor and coach your employees, your teams to perform, right? So I'm curious, how do you think about performance both for yourself as well as for your teams when we, when it comes to not necessarily military, but more your, your, your job as a, as an entrepreneur. I think it's, it's helpful to separate the, you know, the missions and the higher level visions, whatever you want to, to label them of, of what you're trying to achieve. And that could be a short term goal. Is it, getting funding within the next nine months or 12 months? Is it hitting a revenue target? Um, whatever that, that higher level uh, goal is. And down from that, then if there are multiple teams, clearly multiple teams have got their own um, tasks that they've got to deliver to achieve that vision. And within those teams, then we're down to the individuals. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, at every level, everyone has got to um, perform to the best of their ability um, at every leadership level um, those leaders or managers have got to look after themselves uh, make sure that they're in the right position there's that um, you know description of being on an airline and if the oxygen masks come down as leaders very important to make sure that your oxygen mask is on first before mm. you then start um, helping others but it's um you know leaders looking after themselves make, making sure that they are in the best position to do their job and and making sure that others within their teams can deliver and for me you know leadership is 
uh, you know, that, that's a, a massive subject, but, um, you know, a key part of it is, is trying to get individuals to perform to the best of their ability and to, to become the best versions of themselves at work. And we all know, certainly um, as entrepreneurs, we spend you know, a huge amount of time with each other in a work environment, uh, often more time than we do with our families. And so, you know, it's important to get all of that right. And, you know, when it works, it is just fantastic when everyone is, is pulling in the same direction and, you know, you have those good days or weeks when, yeah, you're just killing it. Um, so it's, it takes a lot of time and effort for sure, but yeah, it's, uh, when it works, it, it really works. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe one more military question and then we'll move on to your, uh, the dog toy business probably. I think that was one of the first things, right? That you mentioned. Um, so thinking back, back about your military career, what was maybe one of the most difficult moments? I think maybe that's going to paint in kind of a picture um, and put some perspective on it, perhaps. There were quite a few, but the one that stands out was in Afghanistan in um, June 2006 and on a patrol um, into what we thought of was, was a benign area. We were there to talk to um, the elders in a village um, to explain that we were trying to bring some security so that um, non-governmental organizations could come in to deliver an educational program, um, health, improve the roads. And um, deliberately so, it was conscious planning and decisions that we were uh, extended beyond the range of our own protective artillery if we needed it. But to, to cut a long story short, um, we got attacked when we were leaving that village and um, the normal uh, fast air, so uh, fast attack aircraft and helicopters that would normally come and support had been diverted and were on call to another situation. And I remember um, a friend of mine called uh, Alex Aida, who was responsible for coordinating all those air assets and, uh, and, and reinforcements, turned to me and said in the middle of a firefight, um, yeah, we, there's nothing coming. Uh, we are on our own for the next couple of hours. And I think at that point in time was probably my lowest. Um, but I had a job to do. I was responsible for uh, almost 50 people and a couple of civilians um, on this patrol. And so had a very quick moment of introspection and had to fall back on everything I'd been training, learning, practicing over the past uh, or the previous 15 years. And so I uh, came up with a very hasty plan and had to deliver that with confidence to everyone in that situation to get us out of um, what was a, at that point, a pretty dark place because if we were close to taking multiple casualties and if we had have taken um, one or two or three or four casualties, we would have taken more and it had the potential for none of us to get out of that alive. So um, that was a, a pretty tough spot. Um, in the end, we all got out with nothing but cuts and bruises to this day it all came down to just the the courage the tenacity of every single individual uh in that organization and um everyone you know rose to the challenge as it were um but that was a that was a pretty tough time wow i was holding my breath for a while there at the moment that's yeah i mean yeah that's uh, Great example, good story, and yeah, I think that kind of paints a picture of, I guess, what what it, what what it really can be like. Okay, then, <laughs> from the most difficult moments to dog toys. So how how did that happen? <laughs> um, yeah, based on personal experience, I had um, I had a little Jack Russell, a little terrier at the time, and I would always take him to the park and pick up a stick and and throw it for him. And I threw this, it was a real rubbish throw um, on this particular time, and the stick traveled end over end and lodged into the ground, a bit like a javelin, just as the, uh, as the dog, my dog ran onto it and it crunched into his mouth. I feared the worst, there was a bit of blood. I took him to uh, the local vet and um, thankfully, he wasn't seriously injured, but I got the biggest debriefing 
um, I think of my life, forget anything that happened uh, in the military when I, I made a mistake, which is quite often. But um, uh, this vet told me in no uncertain terms that throwing sticks for dogs was, was just not not a thing to do. So many dogs get uh, killed uh, and seriously injured every year from their owners, well-intentioned owners throwing sticks for them. Um, so on the way home, I had a think about that and I thought, them, well, obviously the, the the pet toy and the dog toy industry is hugely competitive, lots of different options, but I um, did a quick search, thought there would be lots of safe sticks. Um, there weren't, so, so that was it, set about designing a rubber stick and yeah that was uh, an interesting experience I was a I was a solo founder but took lots of advice did, lot, did lots of research got multiple bits of rubber every time I would get a series of samples the first test was to take this piece of rubber give it to the dog if the dog didn't like the smell of it okay well that was instant uh, feel the next piece if he didn't mind it or wanted to chew it uh, okay it takes the the dog sniff test um, but then I would put it in a bucket of water and did it float uh, so lots of criteria and I think because I was a, a solo founder uh, I found it tough trying to bounce ideas off very naive um, I made every mistake going trying to get this product designed manufactured and brought to market but um, yeah it started started selling I couldn't make them fast enough we sold out of our three production runs uh, one after another each one um, uh, having you know, doubled in size I think from the previous one so yeah it was a great experience and that was just as I was leaving the army wow and it one thing that's a constant pattern when I talk to founders on the on the podcast is I would say 70 80 percent of them probably solve their own problem that's that's how they come up with the idea for the business it's, it's solving yeah. their own problem and that's how I guess, I mean, you really care about it. You, you do your research because you really want to solve the problem and there's just no no good alternative. And then eventually you're like, well, then I might as well just build it, right? And it's, it, it's interesting. It keeps coming up over and over and over again. So that was the, the case for you as well. And did I, so I did a little bit of research. Were you on Dragon's Land with that business? I did, yeah. Um, so this was 2010 and the whole entrepreneurial um, funding ecosystem um, that we we know and love today you know just wasn't there and I was looking at different sources of funding and I think um, I opted for some more traditional options I took out a bank loan um, I did put a lot of money in I extended uh, credit cards uh, well beyond the limits of what I should have done uh, remortgaged my house um, but just couldn't get the capital to, to make um, these toys fast enough so yeah I looked at, at Dragon's Den and got a slot uh, on I think of series 11 and that was a great experience although uh, going on to to pitch a dog toy clearly I needed a dog so I couldn't take my little Jack Russell um, he would have I never run around uh, the place and cause chaos. So um, I I hired a dog. Um, what I thought was going to be a well-behaved dog, it was very very good. But um, it was the series when the set had a spiral stair staircase uh, up onto the platform where the dragons were, and everyone who was pitching had maybe five minutes to go in just to familiarise themselves with the set before filming started. And I practiced walking up the steps with the dog. Um, it had a six sticks uh, in its mouth. Uh, we were going to walk up the steps, do a little turn, and he was going to sit down beside me. And um, I would take the dog toy out of his mouth. Okay, that happened twice. Perfect in rehearsals. Okay, here we go. And as we walked up, when filming started, uh, we got to the top of the steps. The dog tripped. Uh, he dropped the dog toy. He got tangled up in one of my legs. I reached down to pick up the toy. It was covered in spit. Uh, and I just felt this this situation oh, no. all going south pretty rapidly. And so managed to, I think, untangle myself from this dog lead and uh, regain some sort of composure. Um, got on the spot and, and started my pitch. <laughs> Great start, huh? <laughs> oh wow but you said overall the experience was sort of positive um it was in terms yeah of, yeah it was um 
I got a, a segment that was screened for about two minutes, so I think it was in there for maybe 20 minutes, and I was pretty confident with the numbers and um, and the whole the whole story. But what came out was my naivety and some of the mistakes I'd been made been making, and um, the uh, supply chain and the costs that were involved in that supply chain and my margins weren't um, as high as they should have been. Um, but it was a great experience, um, had some great feedback from uh, from the Dragons. Um, I remember Duncan Bannatyne famously telling me that um, I would never sell many and so he was out. Um, so I left, I left the den, I think, fixed on the idea and emboldened that I was going to prove this bunch of dragons wrong and um, when we sold our millionth unit I sent all the dragons who were on the show at the time a um, special edition sort of yellow golden coloured safe sticks just to say there you go uh, we sold a million so far and we're just getting started. <laughs> nice. That's that's nice, and then so overall, that's that business is still running, right? So that's called it's called still running, sticks. Yes. I'm not sure if we uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned the name. Correct. Yeah, it's uh, Kong uh, Safe Stick. So Kong, a fantastic company, make um, some amazing products. Uh, we did a deal with them. In fact, um, not long after that appearance in Dragon's Den, and uh, we've sold uh, over six million units uh, worldwide, and uh, and still going strong. Nice. Okay. Very cool, but that is not your only your only business, right? You got a few other things going on. That's true. I tried to um, so my my time with the Red Devils and as a professional skydiver, uh, just as I left the army, um, I looked at the skydiving world and came up with a, an insure tech product. And um, pardon the pun, couldn't quite get it off the ground. It was um, personal insurance for um, the, the skydiving market. Um, I was up and running in the UK, um, in the US as well, and looking at um, a couple of Middle Eastern countries, but um, just couldn't quite pull it together, timing, um, resources and so on. So that was, yeah, I think a little bit painful. Um, looking back on that, I think I should have recognised and accepted that this wasn't going to work, or at least I couldn't make it work with the resources that I had and probably pulled the plug earlier. But I, I clung on to it for probably six months too long, trying to make it work, putting more uh, mm -hmm. money and time into it, but it, um, it just wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that, I launched with a business partner, a financial services company aimed at offering financial advice to service leavers. Um, there is yeah, an increasing amount of, of education offered to those in the military as they're transitioning out, but you know things like mortgages, which we don't know anything about because um, the army provides housing, um, and so just getting that education, that financial education, um, wasn't really there. So I started a business. In fact, it was in two thousand seven, um, called Armed Forces Financial Services, and that's still going going strong. Uh, my business partner is very much the brains behind that as a financial advisor, but that mm -hmm. um, that, that that ticks along and provides. A you know, really good service and advice to the lots of service leaders and veterans. Uh huh. Okay. Quick story that I just remembered. So I, I kind of half remembered it before, but I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't remember the whole thing. But um, when you were talking about how you sent the like the after you sold one million units of the dog toy, how you sent the special one to the dragons. Um, do you know what's the story be behind Weatherspoons Pub? How it got its name? No, I don't. No, so so Weatherspoon is, is it's a pub. I mean, everyone in the UK pretty much knows it. It's like yeah. probably the biggest pub chain in the UK, right? And um, quite cheap as well. And they're just everywhere. They're, I think they've got like thousands of places. I think the funny thing is, so the founder of Weatherspoon was when he was he was not he was never very good at school, and one of his teachers in I believe mean, was it like elementary school or so. One of his teachers told him that he's never gonna achieve anything that he's just too stupid basically he's never going to be successful in any possible way and that teacher's last name was weatherspoon and the guy <laughs> the founder he started the weatherspoon pub chain and he named the pub after that teacher because he said i'm going to awesome. make this so huge and i'm going to make that guy remember <laughs> what he said <laughs> that's a great story and i think <laughs> You're know, talking on you know, LinkedIn and other platforms with so many other founders. 
you know, I think those those early stages and all the no's and all the rejections, um, you know, can go one or two ways. And we were talking earlier about motivation and leadership. And, you know, I, I definitely think that, you know, as entrepreneurs, it's a case of, of taking all of those no's and just, you know, changing our perception of them and using that as fuel to mm-hmm. motivate us and, and be more determined and, and prove, prove those naysayers wrong. Yeah. I do think that that's, that's a large part of, I don't know if it's a skill or just a personality, but I mean, inevitably, inevitably there's a lot of failures and, you know, people who are going to tell you that it's impossible. And it's, I mean, you need to be smart about it as well, because sometimes it is not possible or you're, you are not the right person to do it. Right. But uh, sure. sometimes yeah. you are, and sometimes you need to give it a try. And I think another good example of that is anyone who's raising funding, right? Um, if you go and raise funding with age, angels or uh, VC funding, I think on, I don't know what are the average numbers, but it's crazy. On average, people pitch like 200 investors and then 10 of them are going to invest, right? So that's a lot of rejections. And that's a lot of people who are experienced in the space and they tell you, mm, no, this is not going to work. I'm not going to give you money. Like, how frustrating can that be, right? But you just have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And um I mean, I had a similar experience myself in Switzerland where I raised some money with a startup I had there. And I would say we were relatively lucky. So we did not pitch to 200 people, but we did pitch to 50 to 70 probably. And in the end, you know, maybe 15 or so invested. And that's still a lot of no's. And that's still a lot of people who are, again, really knowledgeable in the space. And they tell you that they usually don't tell you that it's a bad idea, but they just don't give you the money, which, you know, it's essentially a very similar thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess that kind of perseverance. Um, and I talk about it sometimes on the podcast, like when is, or I ask that, especially when, when, when should you actually give up, right? Especially when you're testing something new. It's like, well, until when is it perseverance? And when is it, when does it become just, you know, pure, stupid, going forward when there's no point in going forward, right? And it's tricky. And I I don't know, I never know what the answer is. I think over time with experience, you kind of get that gut feeling for it. Um, Yeah, that's a tough one. And it it is, it is a balance. Um, You know, for me, I mentioned the skydiving insurance and I should have accepted, I think the challenge is, that were there that I, I wasn't going to overcome. But, you know, I think it's that external validation and, and some sort of data that can inform what up to then is a subjective sort of personal view, maybe that's been reinforced with friends and family saying the right things. Um, but I think there's got to be that objective data that, that's mm. got to inform that decision. And you can choose to ignore it. Maybe you were for example, you know, asking all the wrong customers if they would buy your product or mm. um, if they would pay X amount for um, for your service, whatever it is. But I think it's, um, uh, you're right, it, it, maybe it's a mix of experience, a bit of advice. Um, it, it can be a tough one to ignore that data. And there's so many great examples of, um, of founders ignoring that objective uh, external viewpoint whatever it is and having the is it faith is it confidence is it stubbornness mm-hmm. just to go ahead and um uh, and get to a point then where they they you know prove everyone else wrong yeah there are i think was it starbucks and now i'm not going to remember what exactly was the story but i think starbucks like the founder of starbucks he went and he pitched to like hundreds, I want to say maybe like thousand investors. And it was like some crazy number. Well, Harry Potter is also a good example, right? So yes. JK and Rowling, she yeah. went to, I don't know how many publishers, but it was like a lot, a lot of publishers. Everyone rejected her. And then, well, obviously in the end, it was a massive, massive success. Yeah. I do think that those are exceptions. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, sometimes, obviously, yes. And that, because they're exceptions, they're so well known, right? Yeah. But... Yeah, eventually, at some point, it's like if, if there are too many rejections or if, if you don't get any sort of confirmation, it's, it's probably a good idea to say, well, I don't know if this is going to work. 
yeah, I think at some point, um, whether it's whether you're just stubbornly optimistic and ignore what is a mounting level of, of evidence or validation, um, but it yeah, it comes down to a, a bit of balance of. I think having some degree of faith clearly because you wouldn't start the process yeah. but if it's if it's two years everything is saying screaming at you that this is a bad idea then um i think it, it does take a certainly for me it took um, a bit of courage a bit of confidence a bit of inward looking time to go yeah you know what it's, it's time to call it a day and you know let's let's move on yeah yeah Especially, so I think one thing that happens often, especially with technical founders, um, and I'm technical myself, right? So I've got a computer science degree and I, I come from a primarily technical background. And what we techies like to do is we like to build, we don't like to sell. And then you just build, build, build something and you never actually properly test it, validate it in the market. And you can easily spend not just months, but yeah, years building something. And, it, you know, it's, it's fun, but... Uh, <laughs> At some point, you, you have to ask yourself, am I doing this for for fun and for hobby or am I yeah. doing this for business, right? And that's a common mistake that I think among founders is quite well known, but among um, especially anyone who's just starting out, it's not necessarily that well known um, and it can feel very important to keep building the product. And it, it's kind of safe as well because, you know, it just there, there's no... Uh, it's just you on your own building the thing. Um, as soon as you put it in front of the customers, it's like, yeah, yeah it's a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, for but, sure. Uh, but, but if um, you know, if your livelihood is dependent on yes. on getting a product to the market, that can really focus your your attention. Yeah. If if funding isn't an option, um, and you've got a a very healthy bank account then yes i suppose you do have that luxury to keep tinkering to keep improving things just to try and get the best possible product to market but yeah i think um obviously the whole mvp model and, and lean startup um uh sort of movement does i think increasingly force people to okay get something out there um might not look pretty but um you've got to get something out there because that's when the real, real feedback will will start to follow yeah yeah and you, you bring up a good point right if your li livelihood is on the line i always recommend people to somehow try to have skin in the game in mm -hmm. any possible yeah. way so i think at the very least if you start financially investing in that a little bit. So if you put some money towards it, whatever that might be, whether that's ads or I don't know, some freelancer that you need to hire or whatever it is, because that immediately makes it a little bit more painful and you feel like, well, okay, now I'm actually <laughs> spending money on it. So I should also start getting some money back. As long as you got no skin in the game, it's just too comfortable to not um, make that move, right? I, I agree. Yeah, sweat equity is one thing, but um, it's, it changes the whole situation when you start putting in yeah. uh, some money, it's, even if you start borrowing that money, and um, even which has got to be repaid at some point if it's from family, friends, or um, you know, from a line of credit. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving forward a little bit uh, on the timeline. So I think was then Arc X is that already the next business, or did we skip anything? Yeah. So um, I did. Yeah almost five years in, in the corporate world, which uh, for me came kind of at the right time. Um, it was, I had a fantastic um, mentor as the CEO and um, got a couple of rapid promotions within a short space of time and, um, and ended up having a responsibility for a number of different teams. It was, yeah, fantastic in so many different ways. Um, there's that, uh, you know, great adage of of not being the, the smartest person in the room, or if you are the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I was definitely in the right room. I was just surrounded mm. by some seriously bright people. Um, but I was employed to bring a little bit of um, sort of rigor and planning, and I suppose that sort of military ethos to um, uh, provide a bit of structure. Um, so that was a great experience running marketing and innovation. So there was um, lots of product development and um, um, and almost an entrepreneurial spirit within uh, within a couple of teams, but I, I left that in 2019, 
and started, yeah, uh, an idea for a wearable tech. Again, based on personal experience, I was on a skiing trip with a friend. Uh, we wanted to get away and, uh, and do some serious skiing. On, on day three, his uh, ambition got the better of his talent. Um, he asked me to just move down the slope a little bit and, uh, and film him going over this jump. I said, yeah, you know what? I think that jump's just a little bit too big for you. Shut up, Blair. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, over this jump he went and I heard this uh, loud crack as he tore his ACL. And so uh, that was the end of his skiing trip. But um, So I started skiing by myself, listening to music and podcasts, but I found that you know, when I wanted to skip a track or adjust the volume, I couldn't do it with the glove fingers. Um, so I had to stop, take my glove off, reach inside my jacket, get my phone out um, and change the, the playlist or whatever it was. And so I thought there must be a better way of, of doing this. Because um, I had a similar experience running and cycling and in the gym where both my hands were occupied or I was focused on my activity and couldn't easily change my song to get a more motivational song to get me through the rest mm -hmm. of that activity. So that was the start of the process in 2019 and jumping ahead, I don't know if I'm uh, second guessing one of your next questions, but yeah, we're, we're just about to launch and it's been three years of, yeah, quite a slog. I know every business is hard, but I find that hardware is, is definitely hard. Um, you know, all the additional challenges of, logistics and supply chain and and getting physical products to market um but yeah it's been a interesting and challenging three years i was definitely going to ask about hardware product development because i've um i've never done any hardware i've heard a lot about it i come from software which is in my opinion very easy again because you just you know i mean you just write some code you just change things very quickly <laughs> oh there's a bug oh no problem we're just going to fix it and it's going to be fine tomorrow <laughs> and the iterations are very quick the it's relatively cheap uh, in comparison to hardware so i'm definitely curious um how was your and you don't have do you have technical background or how did you actually get into you know developing no. a, a hardware product so i had the idea um i went on a design sprint with a, a, a wearables um, agency got some friends in on that just to um, develop that that concept and yeah i find that tough because i it was what we came out with is very different to what i had in my mind and i think it took a, a you know, a lot of soul searching for me not to um, be really prescriptive and and um, dictate what I wanted to come out of this. But we went with an idea that um, I hadn't really thought of in terms of the form factor of, of this wearable. Um, and that was the idea. And then I, I set about looking for a CTO um, through a series of events, uh, met uh, Kumar, just you know, the perfect person at the right time, just came with all the right experience. You know, we headed off personality wise and um, yeah, I've been, I've been battling through this for the, the last three years. So he brought a lot of industry knowledge, uh, worked at Intel, Texas Instruments, um, but more recently as a consultant, had lots of contacts uh, through Europe and, uh, and into Asia in terms of manufacturing and mm -hmm. both in terms of the hardware, but also um, the, uh, the software. So his background is as a, a embedded software engineer. Mm -hmm. And did you did you raise funding for this, or did you just self finance it, or how did you do that? We bootstrapped it for the first eighteen months, so we mm -hmm. put in um, two hundred k between us, mm -hmm. um, and realized okay that would get us to a, a certain stage, and that got us to a prototype number. I think three or 3.5, but we realized we were going to um, need some additional funding. So we raised a, a friends and family round. That took us to um, almost the de design for manufacturer stage. So we'd gone through the whole prototyping um, process, um, had tested it backwards and forwards, got lots of feedback from users and um, uh, sort of friends of friends trying to, we tried to go outside our immediate group so we wouldn't get that um yeah, yeah. i suppose nice uh, feedback but got some honest feedback uh, and then we raised another round uh, which we closed three months ago and so that gives enough runway to 
get the first batch of products to market. They land in about two weeks into the UK. We've got another batch of about 5,000 units that are coming hot on the heels of that. Um, but it's not just the, the hardware, which obviously was challenging enough. We see more value longer term coming from the software. So yes, it is a it is a wearable. Uh, it's a little joystick on a ring effectively, but uh, we see that camera. we can do a lot more with uh, the software. So we are spending a lot of time developing that um, just to improve workouts and all the um, physical insights and, and performance insights that we can offer uh, customers. Uh -huh. Fascinating. Well, first of all, congratulations on the launch I think there are a lot of hardware products that never actually Thank even you. make it to the launch. So I, I do think that that's quite an achievement in itself already. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, we did. Um, we also did a Kickstarter and an Indiegogo, and you know, just hugely grateful for those early adopters, those people that were prepared to to take a risk and throw some money mm -hmm. into a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we've gone through. They they've gone on the journey with us, you know, to, uh, and that's a bit of a cliche, but, um, you know, they followed the highs and lows. Some of them lost faith about six months ago and, uh, were quite rightly critical that we were just another, um, crowdfunding campaign that wasn't going to deliver anything. But, um, I remember saying to one of them, look, we, we will make this happen. Uh, I'd rather give up a, you know, sell a kidney than, uh, than let this thing go under. We know that we've got a great product. We know that there's a lot of demand out there. We will make it happen. So just, uh, so just bear with us. So we're hugely grateful to um, all of those backers. Nice. Very cool. And so now it's, is it possible to order it on your website? It is. Yeah. Um, so we're taking pre-orders. Um, uh, so arcx.fit, um, just to blatantly plug um, uh, our, our website. So arcx.fit. And uh, yeah, we're offering a 10% discount uh, for anyone who wants to place a pre-order. But uh, we're hoping that uh, when we all start the new year and we all have those uh, New Year's resolutions to get more active, um, mm -hmm. that people will find uh, the utility of, of our product to just uh, they listen to music when you exercise, then uh, this was designed for you. Mm. Yeah, especially it seems very useful for, as you were saying, skiing. Uh, is it waterproof? Can you use it for swimming? For it is waterproof. Well? You can swim with it. So we got it rated mm -hmm. to IP67, which means um, it will um, perform really well down to one meter for at least 30 minutes. But we've tested it uh, for a lot longer than that. Um, it's a, you know, for video, obviously I appreciate people listening to this, uh, won't be able to see it, but it's just a little joystick inside a little piece of tech, but that is interchangeable through a whole series of different sized stretch fit rings. So it will stretch over a glove finger, uh, it can uh -huh. fit inside a little handlebar mount. So if you are cycling or on a rowing machine, you can Velcro this and it sits just beside your thumb. And so if you, um, want to change the volume or skip a playlist, skip a track, whatever, uh, just to get you into that little, um, you know, sort of performance zone. If you need a bit of extra juice from your playlist, then rather than take a hand off that handle and search for your phone or try and get a sweaty finger onto, um, uh, an earbud or whatever, then yeah, just flick the joystick and it's, uh, works instantly. Easy. Nice. It makes so much sense now when you explained it, why, is there any competitor doing anything similar? Cause I know, well, clearly you said that you you looked, you were kind of trying to solve your own problem again. So I, I imagine that the answer is basically no. Cause the only other, um, sort of similar products that I know are things like aura ring, right? Which is a completely different focus. It's focused on like tracking your sleep and, um, very different purpose, yeah. I guess, very different target audience. Um, I mean, there's some fantastic wearables out there and, you know, the tech just keeps getting better and better or a, a market leader, you know, rightly so got some amazing tech into, into their products and the insights you get from sleep tracking and your level of, um, I suppose your ability to take on whatever sort of performance the next day. Um, yeah, that's a great product, but very different to, to ours. So most other smart rings are that fixed size and they either mm. offer like aura, um, activity, uh, metrics and, um, biometric information, or they offer contactless payments or access control. But ours is mm. very different design purely for, 
uh, sports and fitness and for everyone who likes to uh, listen to music and it's a much easier uh, way of controlling music particularly if you're wearing gloves or, or using both your hands yeah yeah but as um, I'll just add as well, it's quite versatile, so it's based on Bluetooth. So our our core, uh, I suppose, user um, and idea is all about music and, uh, and sport and physical activity, but um, it also controls any other device. So wireless speakers, sports cameras, um, again, in that sort of physical activity arena, but um, actually makes a nice little presentation clicker. So we'll connect to pretty much any device. Even that. There you go. I love that it's quite, as you were saying, that there's like a, it's ideal for a specific niche. At least in my mind, I see how, it, especially, yeah, if you're doing some sports where you need to be wearing gloves, where it's extremely inconvenient taking off those gloves, um, reaching for your phone, if you're skiing, if you're swimming, I mean, even more difficult. And I guess, I mean, there are headphones, they're also waterproof, so you can, mm. you can use um, earbuds, right? And, and then your, your ring to um uh, to kind of switch between the songs or uh podcasts or whatever it is um so i love how there's this very particular use case which i imagine that especially in the beginning is going to be your core target audience and it's it's sort of a niche but it's not even such a small niche it's like it's, it's a huge niche um so it sounds like you're solving that very specific problem which i think it makes a lot of sense so well Good luck with that. That's uh, that for sure. I, I'm sure it's going to go well. Thank you. Yes, we're um, we're already thinking about subsequent products in terms of hardware. But as I touched on before, uh, there's a lot more we can do with the app that um, that comes with the ring and and mm -hmm. how because the majority of the people, um, eighty percent or so, listen to music when they do some sort of uh, physical activity. Um, going to the gym or walking in the park, I've, I try not to stare too much at people because I'm always taking a straw poll in my own mind of how many people are, uh, I've got headphones or earbuds in, but it is the majority of people. And um, yeah, just changing that track, particularly if you're you're really working hard and you're you're in that, that zone, you know, call it a flow state or whatever, where you know, music just gives you that little bit of extra performance or whether it's it might be distraction or inspiration when you're you're doing a physical activity and um, the ability to not lose that state and you know, obviously it's very subjective on your, your choice of song and, and playlist but um, you know, we're doing a lot more in that area with uh, with our app to to deliver the right music at the right time just to enhance your uh, your physical performance. Mm -hmm. Perfect, makes sense. Um, how are you, so obviously I guess that's your main focus right now but you're also still involved in other businesses as far as I understand. How, how do you manage that um, in terms of your time and just focus and attention? Good question. That's always uh, a challenge. Um, yeah, clearly Arcax is, um, I would say, not quite a hundred percent, but it's probably 98%. Um, so yeah, I've got a couple of other, um, things I'm involved with. Um, I am mentoring, um, uh, a couple of other individuals, um, through a great military charity called uh, Heropreneurs. There's lots of other uh, charities doing lots of great work as well, helping service leavers transition into uh, the civilian and commercial world. Uh, so I'm doing that, but um, a lot of it comes down to, I think just good planning and, and falling back on all of that military training. So you know, look at mm. you know, what is the most important um, versus urgent tasks. Um, what can I do? individually um, at night um, or what do I need involvement from my team and it's you know there's so many different tools and techniques but it's um yeah for me it's simple things like the night before just doing a little to-do list not getting crazy and putting 27 things on there because I never get past probably number seven or eight so uh, mm -hmm. you know a couple of key tasks that need to be done the next day and then it's you know quite often it's it's firefighting it's whatever issue comes in an email you know as a founder can make you have a very good day a very good week or you know things can can go south pretty quickly so uh, there is a bit of time to, to firefight and I find making time sometimes you know is it 60 minutes a day that I try and set aside but I, I rarely try and 
I, I rarely have the ability to stick to that, but just a little bit of quiet time. I find it's, for me, it's first thing in the morning with a coffee, just just not doing any active work, but just thinking through some issues of, um, you know, what's coming next? What can I do better? How can I help my team? How can I help them improve? Um, just having a little bit of quiet reflection. Mm hmm. It's interesting. The first thing that you mentioned, right, was work, like, how do you focus on the important things rather than whatever seems urgent? Um, that's been such a big topic for me recently, because I think it's, uh, well, it's so easy to jump on things that are either they seem, especially if they seem urgent, and especially if it's kind of easy, and it's right there in your face, and you feel like you're doing something, but you're not really making a difference you're not really working on anything impactful i feel like it's so easy to get distracted basically by those kind of things so i've, I've been thinking about that quite a lot and there, there are two things that i started since there's one experiment that i ran like a year ago and i talked about it on the podcast but i'll briefly describe it again um i was at some point for a few weeks i was tracking essentially every minute of my day pretty much so i had uh timer on my laptop that sent me a notification every 15 minutes and I logged my time and I would write what I was working on and then at the end of the day and at the end of the week I kind of reviewed my day and it was shocking sometimes because you just realize how sometimes your time just just goes I don't know something distracts you and then you focus on that and then that somehow takes two hours of your time and before you know it, it's the end of the day and you didn't actually complete that one thing that was actually important, right? And yeah. that was on your to-do. And that was a big learning lesson for me because I kind of realized where my time is really going. And it also made me way, way, way more mindful about my time because, you know, for a while I had that reminder on my laptop, but then eventually I just sort of trained myself to actually be constantly sort of conscious about, wait, what am I actually working on right now? What am I doing? Mm. Is, is this important? Is this a project that's actually makes sense that makes a difference? Um, so then after a few weeks, I stopped doing it. But I think I want to do it again, maybe just once every few months for like a week or so just to get back just to kind of build that mindfulness of my time again, to kind of train myself that I'm actually working on. Um, well, that I'm just thinking about where my time goes, right? And that can be whatever mm -hmm. is important to you, whatever makes a difference, whatever makes you feel fulfilled, whatever is that, that metric that you want to focus on. So that made a big difference. And I think it was really good, a uh, good experience for me. And then the other thing that I was doing for a while was every end of the day, I would actually write down what was the most impactful thing that I've done that day, which again, okay. it's, I found it a very good exercise because I kind of reflected on my day and I was like, oh, well, you know, some days you realize well, there was nothing that was really impactful. Like, yeah. I was, you know, I, I was just busy all day, but nothing really made a difference. Um, and again, it just helps you realize like, oh, okay, well, I could have done that better, right? So let, let's try a little bit better tomorrow. Let's let's actually focus on doing something impactful tomorrow. Um, so again, I would say that that was quite quite useful for me, quite a good exercise. So I guess for anyone who's listening, who didn't go through, you know, 20 years of military to train that, Maybe that's a, a quick exercise or hack to also help sort of train that that muscle and that. Uh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to borrow that. Um, I'm going to start doing that because I'm, you know, constantly thinking about how I think and thinking about how I work and perform. But you, know, you mentioned that example of, of getting distracted, and yeah, you know, we're all only human, and you know, certainly uh, I find it with a couple of different tasks and the ones I don't enjoy, you know, it's the tedious going through a VAT return or mm. some sort of, of admin task that just doesn't interest me, but I know it's important and gets more important uh, the closer you get to a filing deadline. But, you know, the creative sort of innovative tasks that you know, require a, a bit of collaboration and throwing ideas around, you know, really sort of excite me. And, um, or reading about a particular topic that um, I find it too easy to get uh, get distracted. And it does take, I suppose, whether it's a timer on your phone or some sort of other uh, tool to, uh, I suppose, remind yourself, okay, yep, stop doing that, right? We need to get back to some sort of structure and some sort of planning. I think those, those times are important, you know, a bit of free thinking and whatever it's, if it's reading or talking or listening to podcasts. Um, yeah. I think that's 
that's really important. Um, but it all comes back to, I think, structure and planning and having some sort of discipline. Yeah, I agree. Um, I suppose it depends what kind of person you are. For, but for me, definitely, for me personally, absolutely, that's also very important. It just helps me, I guess, also create some kind of um, peace within chaos. If you have a you know, relatively chaotic kind of job and life, then having that structure, I think it just makes it more manageable for me. So certainly helps. Um, a few quick questions before mm. we wrap up. Um, if you are, if you were 20 years old again and you wanted to start a business, what would you do? Oh, good question. I think it would have to be something to do with sport or activity or fitness and tech. Um, you know, there's some great products we touched on, um, some earlier, but yeah, that, that's the sort of space that, that I enjoy that I've, I've loved doing multiple sports, not that I'm any good at, uh, at any of them, but I've tried my hand at most things over the years and, um, yeah, sort of sports and activity, um, probably with, with tech, you know, really enjoyed developing this, this hardware product. So whether it's mm -hmm. hardware or software or a combination of the two, it would probably be something in that space. It's probably focused on something that you're passionate about, especially that, right? Yeah, for sure. I don't think I could, um, you know, some friends have, uh, have discussed business ideas with me more recently, but, um, I, I thought that's a fantastic idea, whether it's a SaaS product or whatever else, but it's not, I don't think it's anything that I could get, you know, super excited about, um, mm. but each to our own. But if it was 20 years ago, yeah, I think it'd be something in that sports and fitness mm. space. All right. Is there any one either book or person or perhaps, perhaps experience that you think had the biggest impact on your career? I would have to say a course and probably no surprise. Uh, it's a military course since certainly my early days that military experience very much shaped um, and influenced who I am today. And it would mm. probably be the, um, the selection course to join the parachute regiment or pre-parachute selection, as it's known, uh, shortened to, to P Company. And it is a uh, pretty rigorous, pretty tough four weeks of, of physical tests. And um, I, was, I was pretty fit, certainly not the fittest uh, in the group uh that, that went through that um that course in uh what was it early 1996 but i think I'd, i came away with just the knowledge and i suppose a bit of confidence that having said i, I certainly wasn't the, the the fittest in that group but um a lot of it came down to just resilience and state of mind and mm -hmm. knowing that if we commit mentally to achieving a, a task or a goal, then you know, our, our bodies will deliver. And mm. it, it's pretty fundamental, pretty rudimentary. You're running from A to B, carrying a heavy rucksack on your back in a certain space of time. But doing that multiple times a day, uh, another uh, quite tough physical tasks, and they are designed to be tough and um, to uh, obviously select people for uh, for airborne forces, but that had, um, yeah, I'm still, still has a, you know, an impact on me, but, um, translating that into the business world and trying to instill resilience, um, and I suppose a degree of confidence in, in teams of various sizes that look, if you commit to this mentally and tell yourself that, you know, this is going to happen, then you, you can achieve no end of things that previously you know you might not have had the confidence to to do that is amazing I, I think that's i think that's so valuable when you when you actually have that proof of what you're capable of right because it's not just like oh you're you know looking at yourself in the mirror and say oh i can do this it's like no you yeah you actually have that proof that you've you've done you achieved something like that um amazing uh Final question. Um, I think as entrepreneurs, we constantly strive to get better, to improve ourselves. Do you have any sort of strategy in your life to constantly improve yourself? 
Not so much physically. I still try and um, either go to the gym or um, I've got two very large furry uh, reminders that come about three in the afternoon, come and tell me that it's time to take them on a dog walk. Uh, so I can't really uh, get out of that one too easily. So, um, but for me, I think my days of competitive or professional sports uh, are probably behind me, but I still like to stay active and you know that's important. But um, I think personal development, yeah, it's, it is it is reading, um, but it's also being being challenged. Mm. Um, you, know, you get to a point sort of in leadership positions where you know, some of your team or some of the individuals in your group will not challenge you um, for fear of whatever it might be. Mm. And so you end up being insulated from some sort of reality. And I think it's getting to that stage and making sure that that the team or anyone can say, actually, you know what, that idea you've come up with sucks for you know the following reasons. Um, you know, here's another suggestion, and mm. you know, learning off people and going back to I think my example of of never being the brightest guy in the room. Um, you know, I, I almost find it uncomfortable if I am because then I, I'm I'm probably not learning enough. So I think being surrounded by you know bright, talented uh, individuals. Uh, people with a skill set and experience that that I don't have that I can learn off. So I think it's a combination of of that and yeah, just just reading, um, trying to read sort of thirty forty minutes every day, um, just to yeah get some new ideas, get a fresh perspective on things. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my plan. Perfect. Well, sounds like a good solid plan. Um, Paul, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'll make sure that we link to ArcX in the episode descriptions. So anyone who wants to pre-order, go ahead and pre-order. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Mattis, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. Thank you, you too. Thanks for listening until the end. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like the content, please do me a favor and click the like button on YouTube or give us five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Uh, leave a comment, subscribe if you want to hear more from us. Uh, that really helps also to get the podcast out there and that helps me get more interesting guests and create even more interesting content. So I really appreciate if you do that. If you have any other comments, questions, feel free to message me. You can find me on Twitter. That's usually the best channel. Um, the link should be somewhere in the description and uh, yeah, check out my Twitter. I try to tweet interesting stuff about similar content that we talk about on the podcast, um, key insights from the podcast as well and just generally stuff that I learn and stuff that I do. So see you. Thanks.